in fact, there was a great study that showed that in the long term, young children and adolescents who consumed minimally processed soy products had a lower breast cancer risk later on in life than those who did not consume soy products. And I thought that was a great thing yeah. to point out because this means that it's actually mm-hmm. healthy throughout the life cycle, not just you know when you're in those uh, years around menopause, but even as children and adolescents, it can help to set you up for a healthier lifestyle. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are really thrilled to have with us a wonderful soul who truly exemplifies practicing what you preach a staunch advocate of a plant-based diet and plant-based nutrition, Dr. Gemma Newman, AKA the Plant Power Doctor, is a British medical doctor, author of the book, of course, The Plant Power Doctor, here on YouTube. You can see the cover right here. I'm a proud owner of one of the books that she signed for me. (laughs) She's also host of the Wellness Edit podcast, so check that out. She has contributed to articles for magazines, including Glamour, Zest, and Healthy Magazine. And if that weren't enough, Dr. Newman is the senior partner at a family medical practice, a member of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and a certified Reiki practitioner. Kind of amazing, huh? She has appeared on the powerful documentaries Vegan, which came out in 2018, and Eating Our Way to Extinction, which released in 2021. I had the thrill of meeting Gemma a few months ago in the flesh, (laughs) as she was a critical member of a panel I hosted on health and nutrition at the Vegans Women's Summit in Los Angeles. She is filled with applicable tips and shares her story and her lifestyle with such passion, yet makes you feel at ease, kind of like a sister in crime, well, healthy crime, that is, (laughs) within just moments of meeting her and being in her presence. And since Breast Cancer Awareness Month is upon us, it couldn't be more opportune to have her with us today to talk about women's health and how a plant-based diet can be so very impactful. So welcome, welcome, Dr. Gemma. Thank you, Dotsie. And thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction. I really, really enjoyed hearing that. I've never heard it (laughs) described quite so well. So thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, hopefully it's, uh, yeah. You, you feel the love, you feel the I love, do. The, the sunshine rays. <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm loving the love and I and definitely need that sunshine because it's quite dark here and it's going into winter. So yeah, need all the sunshine I can get. <laughs> and you are so kind because uh, I think it's like, uh, it's got to be 10 o'clock there or something, PM nine or 10. So uh, you're very, you're very lovely to join us that late because I'm sure you've had a long day, but um I I didn't uh, mention this in the intro, but I also uh, got to meet your wonderful husband um, when uh, I got to meet you at the conference in Los Angeles. And I was just, well, I was so excited to find out that really he's the one that opened your eyes to the benefits of plant-based diet. Because I I just think it's so neat when, you know, a a couple goes on a journey together and and, and one or the other kind of, uh, you know, steps in because of a of a, you know, a personal issue or, or troublesome issue on their own. And then it, it just catapults and flows into the, the energy of the whole family and everybody becomes impassioned, which is obviously what happened. But Richard, your husband told me, 
uh, the story of when he was training for the London Marathon. He's a, he's an athlete. He's a, he's a, he's very he looks very fit to me. <laughs> um, and he kept getting injured though. He had hip pain. I remember him saying, and he just was dealing with what he thought was just a lot of inflammation. So he started reading and researching, and he started eating plants, mostly plants, many, many more plants that he was eating before uh, to see if it would help. And I'm going to let you pick up there so that I don't tell the story because nobody wants to hear it from me. They wanted to hear it from, <laughs> I want to hear it from you. What oh. happened next for, for, well. for you and your, your whole family? Because you have two boys. Yes, we do. And, you know, you were telling it so beautifully, but basically <laughs> it's absolutely right. He was really struggling and he is a fit person. Um, it's, it's interesting, actually, because I also ran the London Marathon. I've actually run it twice. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. How? But you definitely I don't think of myself as an athlete because I didn't do it with a particular goal in mind. Um but I did do it on a plant-based diet, which was fantastic. Um, but anyway, I digress. So Richard did want to run the marathon. He did want to do it in a really good time. He is very athletic. So um, he was getting inflamed. He was getting injured. He was looking into different running techniques. He was looking into different kinds of footwear. He got some coaching to try and help him with it. And the only thing that he hadn't really addressed at that point was the things that he was eating. And he wasn't an unhealthy person. He was eating a healthy diet. Um, but he thought, well, I really want to run a marathon. And what do I do? I think what I'll do is I'll look at what ultra marathon runners are doing because these people are running double the amount that I'm trying to <laughs> run. And then not feeling inflamed so what are they doing differently so it was actually rich roll's book finding ultra that really inspired mm -hmm. my husband mm -hmm. richard and he also read brendan brazier's book um i think it's thrive um yeah. scott jurek's book he read all these books by athletes and people who were training athletes and he thought right that's what i'm gonna do yeah. i'm gonna go on a whole foods plant-based diet mm -hmm. And at the time I had not researched plant-based diets um, and I was curious. I thought, what's going on here? How is this going to be any different from how he was really eating before when he was not unhealthy? Um, and I watched what was happening with real curiosity and also slightly worried thinking, I don't really want to have to change what I'm doing. I don't really want to have to change what the children are doing. Um, and also I was worried about socially. I thought we'll never be invited to our friends' houses again. If people, right. <laughs> if people only have to cook plants, they're not going to know what to do. So I was thinking the practicalities and also the social life, but I was really curious about what would happen. And interestingly, what I noticed was that he was getting better and better. His running times were improving. He required less training, less recovery. Mm -hmm. um, he was feeling so much more energetic. He was able to run a half marathon or a three quarter marathon in the morning, come home, look after the kids. And I was fascinated. I thought this is a real difference that I'm seeing. And sure enough, when it came to the day where he was going to run the marathon again, he ended up doing it an incredible hour and 10 minutes faster than his previous marathon wow. attempt, which is mind blowingly different. You know, it really yeah. is. Um, that is smashing his previous record, but I mean, that's completely, yes, yeah. yeah, <laughs> smashing it out of the water. Yeah. That's just incredible. And so, uh, you know, he, and his, he didn't sort of, he didn't do it with the aim of, um, becoming more athletic or losing weight or gaining weight or anything like that. He just wanted to be able to improve his running time. And he really did. So it got my attention and I began to understand through looking through the scientific research, why that might be helpful, a very anti-inflammatory diet, diet rich in polyphenols, as well as the vitamins and minerals that we need, mm -hmm. um, as well as the amino acids, of course, that we need for the building blocks of the proteins that we need for muscle um, strength. And so, yeah, it really got my attention. And I began to think, because although, you know, I have run the marathon myself. I'm not somebody that is really sort of focused on athletic performance. I'm focused on my patients. So mm -hmm. I wanted to see, you know, could this make a difference for my patients? Could this be something that I could in, sort of include as part of my toolbox to help my patients with their health? And over many years of study, I began to realize that, yes, it could. And, you know, when I started to have the confidence from understanding the dietary guidelines, understanding a lot of the research, the epidemiology, 
when I had the confidence to then talk to my patients about this, it just took my practice to a whole new level. It was truly wonderful to see those patients who decided to embrace this way of life, how they improve their health and how uh, they improve their vitality. And, you know, it's been one of the most amazing honors of my life to see how much it's in fact impacted my patients. It's been lovely. Can you tell us the story of the first patient that you recommended the diet to? Oh, well, I've got I've got many first, but one that really stands out to me. And uh, this was a gentleman that came in and, you know, my, in my practice, I should say, I've got nearly 3000 patients. They don't register with me because they want to know about plant based nutrition. I'm a general family medical practitioner. They register with me for anything and everything. And you never know what's coming through the door. People don't pay for their um, care at the point of service. There's no uh, in general, there's no insurance sort of for that. So literally anything and everything, you become not only a medical doctor, you become a counselor, you become like a friend. Some in sometimes uh, you sometimes take the place of a vicar, I guess, in a traditional or a priest in a traditional society because people, you know, don't have those people in those roles anymore. So you never know what people are going to come in with. And he he sat down and he slumped and he looked utterly miserable. He turned to me and he said, "Doctor, I've been sent home from work and I've been told not to go back." And I didn't know what he was talking about and why. So I said, oh, gosh, what happened? You know, did something happen at work? And um, he said, yeah, I had an on the spot medical and they told me that my blood pressure was too high. And because I have to drive large lorries as part of my job, they revoked my driving license and told me that I needed to get this sorted out. Otherwise, I wasn't able to go back to my work. And I looked at him and he looked completely distraught. And I realized that for him, his job was so important and we needed to get this sorted out quickly. And he said, what can I do, doc? I'll do anything. And I said, well, usually we would need at least three different blood pressure medications in combination to get you to a level that you are wanting right now, because his blood pressure was sky high. It was in the dangerous zone where you'd worry mm. about things like having a stroke. And uh, we didn't want that. So I said, look, we're going to have to start you straight away on some medication. We're going to have to bring you back every few days um, over the course of a few weeks to tr really try and get this under control. And he said, well, what else could I do? And I said, well, you know, there are lifestyle changes that are really important. He said, I don't want to be on tablets for the rest of my life. I don't want to take blood pressure tablets. Is there anything else I can do to stop myself from having to take tablets? And I said, well, I can't guarantee, but there is something else you can do. And I was really nervous about talking to him about this because he's from South Africa. And I knew that he was very much somebody like, like most South Africans that enjoyed their meat. And so I said, look, you could consider going on a completely whole foods, plant-based diet. I'd read some research around some of the benefits of things like beetroot for opening up the blood vessels, um, hibiscus tea for doing the same, flax seeds as well as another great modulator of the, of the blood vessels, allowing blood vessel flexibility. All these things are really important when you're trying to reduce someone's overall um, blood pressure because you're trying to reduce that inflexibility in their vessels, reducing the pressure on their heart. So I gave him some very practical tips and tools. And I said, you can try this, but I'm, I'm very worried. I don't want you to go away without the medications. I want to give you the medications. You can try this way of eating and see what happens. I'll bring you back. So he did. And then when he came back, I checked his blood pressure and my jaw almost hit the floor because he'd gone from 180 over 100 millimeters of mercury, which is very, very high to 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, which is an ideal blood pressure. And I said, what happened? He said, I did everything you said. Oh, I said, uh, and perfection. my blood pressure's come down. <laughs> had he been also taking the medication or had he just changed his lifestyle? he had not taken the medication that I had prescribed for him. Um, so I thought this can't be, this can't be something that he can maintain. This can't be real. So I said, look, come back again. I'll check it again in a few days. Sure enough, came back, checked it again. It was normal. I then brought him back in again so that he could have his medical to allow him to go back to work, checked it again. It was normal. And so I was almost as surprised as he was that 
he had such a dramatic improvement in his blood pressure. And of course, not everyone is going to have the same story. Um, not everybody is going to have such dramatic improvements. But for me, it was really interesting to see this change and to see this transformation within days because it allowed me the opportunity to understand the power of plant-based nutrition in a way that I hadn't fully understood it before and um, yeah that was another really special moment for me and of course he was delighted he got to go back to work which made him very very happy and then he became you know an advocate himself of of um, being able to live a more healthy lifestyle. Yeah what Gosh, it is just, that is truly, truly a, a drop your jaw. Wow. This, this almost can't really be real moment. I, I would imagine, um, you know, his journey in there in the beginning anyway, was, you know, he was, he was sticking to it. Uh, he had to have been almost a hundred percent, but I'm always interested in transformational stories of people because, you know, it, a lot of people don't, can't, really, they don't want to do it overnight, right? They, they really want to kind of process through and just sort of see how bringing more plants in affects. Some people like to, you know, eat vegan three days a week and, and, and not the other days, you know, and some people do like this patient will do it overnight. I um, am friends with a triathlete who, as far as athletes are concerned, athletes would be interested in this. He did, he did it in a very intelligent way. This guy was actually already a vegetarian, uh, grew up in Australia and grew up as a vegetarian. So he was really curious about taking the dairy out as far as decreasing inflammation and improve, improving his performance, right? So what he did was he journaled for six weeks. He took one dairy product, uh, product out about every week, every week to 10 days. Uh, to actually track and see what was happening. He tracked, he tracked five different parameters of his training and recovery and response. And at the end, he of course dropped them all because he felt like he was um, he, on steroids is what he told me. I feel, I feel like I'm taking something. I feel so good when he dropped it all. But I thought that was a really intelligent way for him to do it, to, to really know he didn't have as much of the ethics in mind at the time. He really wanted to see what, what happened to his body. So as you're you know, learning this and seeing this, well, really seeing it in action with your husband, Richard, but you're a Western medicine doctor at the time and still, of course, lean into that for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, what was, what were, what was your journey? Like, were, were you thinking this, that, you know, cause you mentioned, oh my gosh, I got, I really want to change everything for myself and everything for the kiddos, but was it so powerful that it was, that it was almost overnight? And what also, what do you suggest to your patients on how to do it? Yeah, uh, you're so right, Dotsie. It Everybody's different in how they uh, approach these things. For me, seeing my husband's transformation was the beginning of understanding how powerful it could be. Studying over a long period of time allowed me to let those learnings sink in mm -hmm. and to be able to apply them in my practice. And interestingly, I'd already read, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd already read some of the environmental benefits of plant-based living beforehand, but it hadn't pushed me over that threshold into actually making changes myself. So interestingly for me, it took a lot more of a sort of a personal conviction in the end to decide I was going to actually make that shift. Um, and it was more of an ethical choice for me in the end when I began to understand that I, mm. I wanted to widen my circle of compassion. You know, human health has always been a passion of mine. Um, but when I understood that my actions affected so deeply, not just my own life, but the lives of others, and that those actions are not always going to be a compassionate choice if I don't think about where things that I consume are coming from, that was actually my strongest motivation to make personal changes. And I think that's interesting when it comes to health, because, you know, when it comes to my patients, many of them have important health conditions that they're really motivated to want to to shift um, or at least to improve. And I think unless you have a health condition that you're really passionate about improving or that you have some other very personal conviction to make changes, it's going to be much more of a challenge to stick with it 100% because, you know, 
life gets in the way, yeah. uh, routines shift, you know, you're not always in a place where it's convenient. There's 101 things that could get in the way of that. So I think it takes more than just motivation. I think it takes um, either a shift in identity or a real conviction that you want to be somebody quite different from the person that you were before in order to make it something that you sustain 100%. Mm-hmm. And I don't think everybody has to go 100% in all honesty, because, um, you know, in terms of vegan populations, uh, I love the fact that veganism is growing and I'm a huge vegan advocate. I myself am vegan, but I understand that for my patients, sometimes that's not going to be something that they'll achieve uh, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so I always tell them to do whatever they can to improve their health, um, whatever their mental bandwidth allows, whatever they feel they can do at that time. And, you know, when they're really motivated, it can take a five minute phone call. Uh, when they are, have other things going on or they're not so motivated, it can take many different consultations and many different things to realize, or oh, maybe I'll change this about my lifestyle or maybe I can do this. So it really varies person to person. What do you recommend? Because because you see patients uh, for such a short time, do you have a packet that you give them or do you recommend they watch certain documentaries or read certain books? I think our audience would like to know so they can either watch them themselves or read them or recommend to others? Yeah, that's such a good question, Alexandra. And I think for me, honestly, it's actually the reason I wrote my book because I wanted to be able to tell my patients what the research shows in a really simple to understand way that they can read and take in without having to read all the scientific uh, studies. Um, and also some recipes so they can literally understand why then understand how in one package Um, and obviously I'm not selling my book to my patients I I created a website though which is of course free so that um, similar resources to the book are available um, on topics like heart disease and pregnancy and diabetes and um, child health and all sorts of things so they can click on the on the, the links and the podcasts and all the things that I've talked about and get a lot of an understanding through that for free but then if they do want to delve a bit deeper then they can buy the book and that's the reason I wrote the book I wanted it to be um, something a bit similar to how not to die but not so long and with colorful color-coded sections and <laughs> and real life examples and then a few recipes as well that people can see photographs of and feel inspired by that they want to start giving it a try and this is at gemma yeah is that the website um, everybody can go to you don't have to be a patient in, in the uk exactly <laughs> everybody can go to that yeah. <laughs> so you know but there are lots of other resources it depends on the person as well in a way because um you know if somebody for example is really interested in uh, women's health um which is actually a topic that's been under represented in plant based nutrition i feel um then you know for example i've got a great friend who's a gynecologist and she wrote a book with her daughter called living pcos free and her daughter is a nutritionist who ha- who's living with pcos and she's a gynecologist and so i'll recommend their book for somebody who is living with pcos for example um if so you define really... pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome we've talked about it before on the show but just so that our audience can get an idea of it yes well you you got the name spot on so well done <laughs> and essentially what it is it's a condition that you live with which changes how you respond to your hormones in your body um you can you have more androgens which is sort of uh, male type hormones we all have these hormones but your your body expresses them more um and it means that your eggs are not released as regularly as usual so rather than um releasing um, an egg once a month uh, you may release them less frequently so you may find that you have less frequent periods and due to the extra androgens you may find that you have um increased risk of things like acne um some slight thinning of the hair sometimes especially on the top of your head Uh, you may also have excess hair in other places that you don't want it maybe around the jawline for example Uh, you may find yourself more prone to weight gain as well because of the extra 
uh, the ways in which your body regulate regulate hormones that you have less of a hormone called shbg uh, which is a sex hormone binding globulin it's not actually a hormone it's a hormone carrier but it allows you to not necessarily respond to all the hormones you're producing all the time it's like a storage molecule and you have less of that so you are just i suppose more um exposed to the hormones your body's producing and it can be hard because it's also associated with insulin resistance which means that you are more prone to things like type 2 diabetes as well and it's also associated with other things that you wouldn't automatically think of like um, um eating disorders uh, either binge eating disorders or um uh, struggles with your weight and the psychology behind that obsessive compulsive disorder as well, uh, mood and anxiety issues. Um, and so there's a number of different things that, that come along with it sometimes, but the main feature is less regular periods and a propensity to carrying extra weight and an extra hair where you don't necessarily want it. Thank you. And I interrupted you while you were talking about your friend and her daughter who wrote the book. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Nitu Bajakal is the is the lady that wrote the book, and her daughter is Rahini Bajakal, and the book is Living PCOS Free. It's a lovely book, and it's you know it's evidence based. It's got a lot of information for women who live with PCOS because it affects many of us. In fact, especially ethnic minorities, um, there'd be sort of up to twenty percent of uh, people um, of color, for example, will have PCOS. Um, one in ten um, of the general population. Uh, without even knowing it sometimes. So it's it's an important and underdiagnosed issue in women's health, actually. Um, but yes, I also have a section on hormone health in my book, which also covers PCOS, but obviously not in as much detail as an entire book would. Yeah, was, we definitely want to traverse through that. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, since it's um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but I wanted to mention that I love... I love that it's the beginning of your book, the, uh, the chapter that is the plant power lifestyle, like how to live the actual lifestyle and kind of what it means. And you start, you started out with the wonderful quote from Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu that says, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Mm. And I find that a lot of vegans still fall into the river when it comes to certain foods. They still, and, and it's, I shouldn't say they, I should say me too sometimes, um, because we are so conditioned in our society around food and around certain foods. And one of those is, is carbohydrates. And we read that you struggled with your weight and tried a lot of low carb diets. Like that was the direction that you went into and, and, and you lost a lot of weight. Of course, if you take a whole food group out of any, in any diet, you're going to lose weight, I've, I've, I believe. <laughs> so when, what are you telling people and, and, and tell our audience and, and educate us uh, as well on the power of the carbohydrate what carbohydrates are for, uh, why we need them, why, why it's a critical component to a healthy, uh, energy producing whole foods, plant-based diet. And yeah. why they're not, they won't lead to weight gain if they're mm -hmm. whole. Yeah. yeah. Not all of them will lead to weight gain. Yeah. It's, it's something that we have in our culture, don't we? And it's something that we have all taken in over the years, this idea of, oh, if I want to lose weight, I'll just cut the carbs. And you see it in so many different magazines and online. Um, but it's hard to define that, like what it really means, because when people cut the carbs, they think, oh, well, I'll just cut out bread uh, or potatoes. Um, but actually, as you pointed out, um, carbohydrates are an integral part of a, a diet that can help you feel energized and is actually part of dietary guidelines to consume you know carbohydrate rich foods um they contain the glucose which is the brain's primary energy source yeah. so you know we we do need carbohydrates of course and even like vegetables <laughs> vegetables are carbohydrate rich you know they carbohydrates are not just things like you know bread um so it's it's a really difficult thing to explain for people who 
have taken in that kind of hum that oh low carb is good because actually you know when you look at epidemiological data low carbohydrate diets are associated with higher all cause mortality and that's because looking at what people are actually eating people tend to use animal proteins over plant proteins when they are um maximizing their protein intake and minimizing their carbohydrate intake, which does lead to long-term health risks. When you look at large populations of people over long periods of time, there's no denying that there's lots of different studies that have shown this um, meta-analyses as well that have shown um, that, that this is the case. And so we have to think about our long-term health and which is why it worries me when I see that low carbohydrate diets are so popular for instant sort of weight loss. Um, because actually when you look at how people lose weight, there isn't a great deal of difference between those who are eating a low carbohydrate diet and those who are eating a healthy, um, more of a whole foods diet with plants in, you're not seeing big differences in their ability to lose weight. It's about the same, um, certainly in the short term. But then you have to also look at long term health and what you're consuming and how that relates to cancer risk, for example, how that relates to heart disease risk, our biggest killer in the Western world. Um, and these are really important questions that I think it does a disservice to people when they don't understand that having a low carbohydrate lifestyle could well increase their long-term heart health risks. Mm -hmm. And so what I would always really emphasize to people is that it's possible to lose weight with um, a diet where you're taking in less energy. And in order to do that in a way where you're not constantly hungry, it's actually a lovely idea to be full of fiber rich foods mm -hmm. because these fiber rich foods are able to fill up your tummy nicely. Um, you can produce hormones of satiety that make you feel full for longer. And of course, protein is important, but if you emphasize plant proteins, you're also improving your risk, your likelihood of long-term longevity and health, which is clearly very important to most people. So um, yeah, I would suggest plant proteins to be emphasized. I would suggest when you're having carbohydrate rich foods, then whole grains are, are great. Um, and of course, you know, fruits and vegetables also contain carbohydrates um, and nuts and seeds also contain carbohydrates. Of course, they are fat rich and protein rich too, which is great. The right kinds of fats as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's just so important to emphasize um, whole plant foods foods and you're not going to necessarily um, notice any weight changes unless your energy um, intake has shifted and so most people do find that if they make a big shift in their in their um, intake of plant foods they tend to lose weight because they've got more fiber to keep them full that's mm -hmm. not the case for everybody and not everybody wants to lose weight in which case you know, you tend to want to emphasize making sure that you have, you know, maybe protein rich smoothies or things in between your meals, if that's the case for you. So it really depends on the person. Yeah. You, you yourself, as Dossie mentioned, went on a lot of low carb diets and you, you lost weight, but you had other effects that you didn't like that also opened you up to uh, a plant-based diet. Can you share with us what happened when you went on those low carb diets and then when you went in terms of your physical health uh, um, and weight and what happened when you went on a plant-based diet? Yeah, I'd love to share. Thank you for asking. And, you know, for me, I was in my twenties at the time and I hadn't done a great deal of research into nutrition at that point in my career, but I was working tremendously hard and you know, I wasn't looking after my own health particularly. I don't think many junior doctors do. And I just used to grab whatever I could when I could. And I felt so lethargic. Um, I was exhausted. I'd get home from a long shift at the hospital and I could barely keep my eyes open at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, this is not right. I am in my 20s. I want to do this job. I want to be a doctor until I'm in my 60s, 70s, whenever. <laughs> I didn't want to feel this way. So... I decided to emphasize my health then. And I took in that background hum of, oh, low carb works. So I cut the carbs. You know, I had I had chicken and fish and salads. And that was pretty boring, if I'm honest, because that's pretty much what I stuck with most of the time during yeah. that time. <laughs> and, you know, it worked to improve my energy levels. And yes, I also lost weight. So I felt pleased. 
but when I checked my blood profile, I noticed that I had a raised cholesterol. And this surprised me, given the fact that I was so young. Uh, and also, I was aware that my grandfather on my father's side died young of a heart attack. He was playing tennis. He was he was um, just generally quite healthy, unbeknownst to me. He obviously had heart disease going on internally. And he was playing tennis. And then one minute, he just dropped dead. And he'd had a big heart attack. And he was 61 at the time. And I didn't realize it back then. But unfortunately, years later, my father was also going to suffer the same fate. He suddenly died of a heart attack, uh, age 59. And it was not something that, you know, he hadn't been unwell beforehand. He hadn't had any previous problems. So I was quite aware that that might also be something that I would be prone to. But the time I didn't really think there was anything I could do about that so fast forward a few years and then I decided to try a plant-based diet myself and it was a wonderful revelation because I began to realize when I checked my blood levels um, after eating this way that I was able to actually for the first time in my life have a normal lipid profile which was wonderful because you know, I knew that lipid profiles are a, are a marker of risk of cardiovascular disease so I felt really happy that I'd actually been able to address that risk in a way through my diet that I'd never imagined before and another nice side effect that I hadn't been aware of as well was that I was running through my 20s and I needed big knee supports on both knees because I get terrible knee ache when I was running and you know I'm in my 40s now and I go for runs and I've never needed knee supports not since I went plant-based certainly not in the last 10 years so I feel as though you know obviously that's an anecdote that's my story but I really feel as though that's made a big difference for me in my life and it's nice to be able to share those important differences I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, uh, a question about, because this seems like it makes sense to me, but I don't know if there is any evidence. Um, do you think, or do we know if a, a mother's milk of, of any species, so the milk of that species, so in our case, the human moms is, or serves as a, as a map, if you will, um, or uh, at least an indicator of what that species diet should look like. And I am asking that because when I started really looking deeply into what um, all of the elements are of cow's milk uh, and then comparing it to human milk, I learned how much more um, glycogen and carbohydrates are in a human mother's breast milk than there are in cow's milk. Of course, it has fat too. It'd have to have quite a bit of fat as you well, well know for the uh, formation of neurons in the brain. And there's definitely fat in humans, but there's more um, carbohydrate and glycogen in humans, mother's milk. And I thought, well, wouldn't that kind of serve as like the very, the very map as to what we're supposed to eat as we become adults? Or is there like no you know, connection at all. Well, I mean, there could be, that's not something I've actually studied, but I know that human breast milk is obviously made for humans and it does have a slightly different composition, as you mm -hmm. pointed out to cow's milk and, you know, with, with human milk as well, the baby doesn't have quite such a, it's interesting because as the baby gets to about six months mm -hmm. or more, you start to wean. And, and although breast milk is the ideal fuel and it's important that that's still the ideal and uh, most prevalent food source for the baby they do start needing other sources of nutrition um as they sort of you know get to uh sort of eight nine ten months you're going to be sort of mixing it quite a lot with with different foods that you're introducing um and you know breast milk does not have quite such a high um protein content that the baby needs for example and you know you're going to be needing to introduce um other sort of fats as well into the baby's diet so that they can continue to grow and so yeah it's it's an important first food of course it's bespoke to your baby uh, and what's amazing actually about breast milk is that it contains it contains hmos human milk oligosaccharides which are incredible fuel for the baby's new gut bugs that are starting to propagate in the baby's gut. Um, and so, yeah, human breast milk is wonderful. Um, it's not the same, obviously, as cow's milk. Um, but I think, you know, 
it's important to be able to offer formula for new mums um, wherever possible as well, if they can't breastfeed sure. or if they don't want to breastfeed. Um, but yeah, I get your point. I think cow's milk is made to grow baby cows into humongous large cows and right. over a very, very short <laughs> space of time. Yeah. So with that in mind, it's been a very important fuel source for populations, especially in Europe where, you know, in years gone by, nutrition would have been quite scarce especially in the winter months mm -hmm. i can imagine that's why it was such an important adaptation for europeans to be able to digest lactose past weaning um, mm -hmm. during that time in their history because it was a way of getting nutrients in but um, we don't have to do that anymore uh, we have many ways of getting uh, similar nutrients uh, without the need for um, the milk of of a cow that it's made for its baby can you tell us what are the common problems that you see in your patients and how they might well be common among you know most of the developed world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, heart disease is the biggest uh, issue that we face in terms of mortality risk. And then cancer comes number two. Um, we have a big problem with um people carrying extra weight, which can then lead to other health problems and increasing rates of type two diabetes. That's going up a lot as well. That's one of the largest causes of, of what we call morbidity, which means, you know, having to live with an illness. And unfortunately those living with type two diabetes also 80% of those will die of a cardiovascular disease, heart attack or a stroke. So that increases again, the, the likelihood of those things happening. Um, Inflammatory bowel diseases are also going up in, in the UK. Um, and so that's a really important change. I think over the last 50 years, um, that's been rising quite a lot. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things I can think of. Um, in terms of women's health, um, we're seeing increasing rates of things like endometriosis, um, mm. certainly also issues with um, things like fibroids as well, noticing more. Um, so yeah, PCOS, again, I mentioned that before. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously it's partly genetically mediated, but there are things in the lifestyle which make it more likely to cause you symptoms. So yeah, there's a number of things actually. And these sound like lifestyle, most of them lifestyle diseases. Yes, they're all things that can be improved using lifestyle to a degree, um, cancer risk is a big one. Um, and the, all the different cancers that we are now diagnosing, there's about 30 to 40% um, improvements that you can make using lifestyle, uh, which is, which is huge. I think that's something that's really important to share. Um, but also, you know, I guess it's important to make the point that Sometimes we will get sick and sometimes even with the best will in the world and the most healthy diet in the world, we can still experience problems and lifestyle related conditions. You know, we were mentioning uh, earlier in, in speaking about uh, breast cancer and diet because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and you have contributed to two books about living an alcohol free life. Um, I know that basically everyone in the whole food, plant-based uh, diet uh, medical community agrees on uh, the four components of, 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 a, of attempting to avoid breast cancer is eating a whole food, plant-based diet, movement, stress mitigation, and limiting alcohol. So I'd, I'd love for you to speak, of course, to um, cancer fighting foods, but I'm very interested as well in, in this, um, limiting alcohol or living an alcohol free life because you have contributed to a few books yeah. on the subject. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. And I should, I should probably point out here as a caveat that I don't live alcohol free. I do have the occasional drink of alcohol myself. Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly, my husband is alcohol free and many of my friends are, and, um, I think it's a way of life that we really need to celebrate a lot more because um, in British culture, I don't know if it's the same for you. I think it probably is. Alcohol is used as a, 
as a way of celebrating. It's used as a way of socializing. Yeah. It's used as a way of um, commiserating. That there's, it's basically right. used for almost everything. <laughs> um, and it's not healthy. Um, even, you know, the process of, of the alcohol coming into your mouth, there are certain acetaldehyde compounds that are released, which are cancer causing compounds and that's not to be a downer of course because I'm you know I have a glass of champagne at a wedding you know I like to have a cocktail when I'm out with my girlfriends um but I know it's not something that is healthy for me it's not something that's healthy for us as a population and I wish it wasn't something that's celebrated so much and glorified so much in popular culture because it's something that contributes to our long-term cancer risk um ultimately uh and obviously not just cancer we have issues with our liver and um issues right. with our brain health uh, which is so important especially for especially for women right coming around perimenopause and menopause alcohol can be really challenging you know you, you get you know, a lot of more issues with anxiety and brain fog and when you're drinking alcohol alongside that you know it's just not something that 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 is easy for women with their changing hormones to be able to navigate in the same way that they used to, you know, when they were in their twenties. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think that I would love for people to feel empowered not to have to drink alcohol. Um, and in fact, I think that there is quite a movement, certainly in the UK, of people who are, you know, in the younger generations who are actually turning away from alcohol, that it's kind of almost Mm -hmm. becoming cool to be alcohol free. And there's so many different types of cocktails now where, you know, that don't contain alcohol and, and interesting drinks and mixers and uh, tonics that have lovely flavors that allow you to feel like you're treating yourself without the alcohol. And I think that's something to be celebrated. Um, And I would really love to see more of that. Yeah. Will you tell us, I I had not heard of the compounds that are produced in the saliva at at the first sip. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Because I'm curious. Yeah. Well, basically you're, when you, when you put the alcohol in your mouth, mm-hmm. it, it sort it, it releases acetaldehyde and that's something that you can't escape. It's not something that you, you know, you can stop yourself from being exposed to. Mm-hmm. And so even, even just having it there in your mouth, obviously you, you, those compounds you would then swallow or breathe in. Uh, and it's not, yeah, it's not something that you can avoid really, even just consuming the alcohol rather than and they're cancer causing. Yes. Okay. And is that, it's just the, that's just the acid that your mouth produces when alcohol comes in. That's the compounds that the alcohol produce. Yes. When, when you, when you consume it in the body. So what I can say, if you're asking for more detail, the ethanol from alcohol diffuses rapidly into saliva during drinking and then reaches a higher concentration there, which breaks down into acetaldehyde, which then in turn, um, is harmful to human health. They used to say that moderation was the, the thing to do in alcohol because they had studies that showed that people who drank moderately were living longer. And I don't know what the glitch was in those studies. And maybe Gemma, you can, um, you can elucidate. But now in the past year, it, the, the bodies that, that talk about these things have come down very clearly that no alcohol is the best for human health. Yeah, I think that when you look at studies of large populations of people, it's interesting because those who have small amounts of alcohol are probably also those that that never had any issues with alcohol in their past. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you had somebody say that that had problem drinking and they became teetotal, they would also be included in the sort of in the statistics for those who are teetotal just because they don't maybe like the taste of alcohol or for another reason. So, yeah, I think that's probably one of the main confounding factors when it, when it comes to looking at alcohol and health. Um, And yeah, it's pretty clear now where the data lies in terms of alcohol and risk. Um, That's not to say that people should never have it. You know, I don't want to be somebody that is, you know, being so militant (laughs) that people can't have a drink every now and then, but really it's about understanding that, sometimes the benefits have been overstated and we talk about the polyphenols for example in red wine and that's true there are polyphenols in red wine and having a glass of red wine here or there is not going to be um, harmful for long-term health if you do it very occasionally but um, 
if you're going to be looking at optimal health, then you probably want to get those polyphenols from the red grapes. If you, yes. <laughs> if that's the only reason that you, <laughs> that you would want to consume it. But if you want to do it as part of a ritual where you can have fun and relax, then by all means carry on. Um, but it's just nice to know that there are certain caveats that, that mean yeah. it's not such a great healthy choice. Mm-hmm. I would love to stay in that swim lane in improving hormone health um, and, and, and moving over to just foods that you specifically recommend and then ones that you don't uh, for women who are trying to improve their, their hormone health and trying to mitigate their hormonal based cancer risk. Yeah, well, I would say for definite, unless you have an allergy to soy, Soy products are amazing for hormone health because soybeans are a great source of protein. They have all the essential amino acids, but they also contain these incredible um, phytoestrogens, which allow you to improve some aspects of hormonal health that you might struggle with, especially around menopause. So for example, um, if you're somebody that can really metabolize these phytoestrogens really well, mm-hmm. um, these isoflavones in them um, Mm. can actually improve menopausal flushing. Um, What's great about soy is that um, the type of of phytoestrogens or plant estrogens in them are not actually estrogens at all. So men don't have to worry about consuming soy and becoming more feminine. It's actually uh, um, a really important point. Um, The the way that the um, soybeans um, release their phytoestrogens in the body means that they're actually more, um, more, uh, what's the word? Affiliated? Protective? Oh, okay. (laughs) Uh, Let me start that sentence again. The amazing thing about soy is that the phytoestrogens in them are actually uh, more likely to bind to um, sort of beta receptors, uh, beta estrogen receptors in the body, which are more prevalent in bone uh, and less likely to bind to the alpha um, estrogen receptors, which are more prevalent in places like the breast or the womb. So it's actually a wonderful thing because when you consume soy products, in fact, there was a great study that showed that in the long term, young children and adolescents who consumed minimally processed soy products had a lower breast cancer risk later on in life than those who did not consume soy products. And I thought that was a great thing to point out because this means that it's actually Mm -hmm. healthy throughout the life cycle, not just, you know, when you're in those uh, years around menopause, but even as children and adolescents, it can help to set you up for a healthier lifestyle. Um, So, yes, I think soy is fantastic for that. Things like uh, tempeh and tofu and and uh, soy milk and edamame beans. Um, People use miso paste in cooking, which is a great idea. It's fermented soy beans as well. Um, So, yeah, that's the one that I'd really recommend. Uh, Lots of fiber, lots of color. Um, I'm a big fan of things like flax seeds and chia seeds and hemp seeds. You can get Mm. hulled hemp seeds and crushed up chia seeds and crushed up flax seeds, which are just so great for omega-3 fatty acids as well. Uh, Really great for hormone health as well. Um, All the different colors of the rainbow in fruits and veg, um, really important for getting all those vitamins and minerals, phytonutrients to help um, your vitality at this time. And also avoid things like constipation. The more fiber you're eating, the less likely you are to be constipated, which is an important point because when you are constipated, you tend to hold on to hormones that your body is hoping to eliminate through your bowel motions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you're not pooping out those hormones, then you're reabsorbing them through the lining of the gut. And that's not necessarily a good thing for you as well. So definitely things that will help you to open your bowels regularly are um, always a winner when it comes to hormone health and hormone regulation. Yeah. And what about men? Uh, Can you speak to they have hormones too, um, but we talk less about them because I guess women are just more rocked by their hormones on a monthly <laughs> basis. Um, but uh, per- perhaps there's some good reasons for men to go on a plant-based diet to regulate their hormones. Of course, absolutely. And men do, of course, have hormones as well. We have more than 50 different hormones coursing through our bodies. And it's going to be really important for men to be able to regulate their hormones as well. When you get to 
I guess, what would you call it? The menopause. Um, it's not <laughs> such a dramatic change. For I think men. it's called andropause, actually. The andropause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what, okay. Yeah, they, they won't have quite such a dramatic decline. It, it won't feel like such a roller coaster. Um, but they will still have potentially um, a lot of benefits from eating more plant foods, avoiding constipation for the exact mm-hmm. same reasons. Um, and, you know, a way to improve uh, their overall health moving through into those years, 50s and 60s, where you know, they will start to be sort of noticing the effects of heart disease uh, more than ever. Um, noticing the effects of long term conditions like type two diabetes, which is, of course, a hormone driven condition. Um, certainly the insulin that your bodies are produ- producing, you know, your body can become resistant to that unless you're eating healthy sort of plant rich foods. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely vital for men just as much as it is for women. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad we talked about the power of soy. I, I did a uh, a deep dive um, with a scientist that uh, is with us at Switch for Good on the power of soy because we've decided for October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month that we really want to um, kind of uh, crush all the misnomers out there uh, around soy and 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 really help women uh, understand the evidence behind the power of soy instead of spending the month bashing dairy because plenty of plenty <laughs> plenty of people will do that. But when, when um, we were taking a deep dive, one thing that, again, just bears repeating because we're talking about on the show is the, the power of the whole food versus a part of the food. And in you know, certain populations, obviously including many of uh, the women in Asia uh, that ate or drank more soy, they experienced less chronic disease. Those, those studies were done on women who ate tofu, edamame, soy milk in its whole form, as you mentioned. And all of the studies that we looked at, and there's pro- probably more that we didn't look at, but all of the studies that we looked at that showed um, a negative response, if you will, uh, to soy or that some tumors grew in rats were all done on soy isolate. None of those studies were done on the whole source, right? So it, it's apples and oranges, the, the way well, I yeah, understand I mean, it. That's, that's a good point, Dotsy, but also what I find quite frustrating when people mm-hmm. try to talk about the uh, confusions or controversies around soy is that usually when they're citing a study, it's an animal study. Oh, and, right. right, right. Uh, I'm glad you are, brought that up too. <laughs> <laughs> animals are not humans. Mm-hmm. And so obviously we are human animals, but certainly when you're looking at a study on a rodent, your body is not going to respond the same way as a rodent would necessarily. And certainly when you look at populations of people, the opposite is true. Um, it's an, it's a really misunderstood bean. And I wish people knew the power, as you've rightly put it, of soy to be a really powerful way of improving health, reducing cancer risk rather than increasing it. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, soy products have been shown to reduce many diff- risks of many different kinds of cancer in humans. Uh, and that's something that mm-hmm. we can see from human populations and from actually consuming soy in its whole form. So yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. I think when you're looking at small scale mechanistic studies, you have to also be able to back up that information with large scale human studies to be able Mm -hmm. to feel confident in what you're saying. And so when people talk about some of the harms, they're not looking at humans and they're not looking at large scale studies. Um, They're usually Mm -hmm. looking at small studies on rodents and it's just not the same. What about pregnant women? They have a lot of hormones coursing through their body, but they also have a little one inside. And a lot of women who might be vegan themselves might feel like, well, I can't do it to my child because there's so much information about, well, raising a child with a quote unquote, well-balanced diet. And for some reason, people think that McDonald's is often included in that and they don't seem to bat an eye, but God forbid you should take away some dairy and they freak out. But um, explain to us, what do, you, what do you say to a pregnant woman about the benefits of her remaining vegan or becoming vegan um, during her pregnancy and raising that child vegan? 
Yeah, so this is a wonderful point because, you know, if we're going to empower everybody to have a plant-based lifestyle, we're going to be able to make sure that they feel comfortable doing that during pregnancy and beyond. And luckily, you know, the dietary guidelines are quite clear that a well-planned plant-based diet can be suitable for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy and including nursing and including young children. Um, But may I just stop you right there? The well-planned, I think, scares people. Because the truth is a well-planned omnivore diet is also important, but we seem to not add that in. And that's why we have so much unhealth. Sorry for that. And that's not a word, but unhealth in our later years. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. Every diet should be well-planned. But I think the reason that we, that we continue to say it has to be well-planned is because sometimes, you know, people don't always necessarily know first of all how to eat in a healthy plant-based way they will think okay well i'm used to eating meat and vegetables and you know it's just everything's got meat in it and everything's got dairy in it maybe if i just cut out meat and dairy then i'll just that will be enough Mm -hmm. and of course that's not really enough and so i think when you're looking at sort of populations of people who haven't necessarily put much thought into the things that they eat it's going to be important to know actually you know it's great to include all these different food groups you know fruits and veggies and whole grains and legumes and beans lentils chickpeas herbs spices nuts and seeds and this is how you cook with them and yes you do need a b12 supplement and here's why and you can feel so abundant when you enjoy all these different kinds of foods and find Mm -hmm. out what it is that you love and make it plant-based and be aware of these key nutrients that you can enjoy more of. And, you know, you know that you can then have an abundant lifestyle. I think I would love for people to all feel empowered to have a completely plant-based diet, but I think for that to be the case, it's important to emphasize there are some key nutrients to be really more aware of um, than you would otherwise have been. And again, on a on a meat eating diet, the same thing applies. There are certain nutrients that they would be low in um, that they wouldn't necessarily be aware of, like magnesium or folate, for example. Or fiber. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> they may well be very fiber deficient. Um, and so that's the beauty, I think, of a plant-rich diet is if you can if you can be aware of the key nutrients to be mindful of and um, start to cook foods that you're really enjoying and preparing foods that you love and the family love, then that's that you know that's half the battle won and you know that you've that you've got a really vital and fabulous lifestyle so then you mentioned b12 were there any other nutrients you wanted to flag for a pregnant woman yeah i think folate and i think everybody gets folate or folic acid right before during yeah, pregnancy. we. I tend to. I tend to recommend actually that that all pregnant women take their um, prenatal supplement, including folic acid. But vegan women will invariably, for the most part, have high levels of folate in their diet anyway, because they're going to be having an abundant plant-rich diet. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the important nutrients of focus would be iodine uh, as one, because many people. Mm are iodine low even those on an omnivorous diet and don't always know it so you know you can choose iodine fortified plant milks um, or you can choose a non-seaweed iodine supplement as part of your prenatal but you just need to check that it's in your prenatal selenium is another one that it's important to to have in your diet brazil nuts are usually great for that um being aware of calcium needs is great um and there are so many abundant sources of calcium uh, that I'm sure you talk about all the time on Switch for Good podcast. Uh, but it's important for pregnant women to be aware of those as well, especially when they go into nursing, having those calcium rich foods. Um, and vitamin D, I think, is something that many people are not aware of. It's actually quite hard to get through the diet, whatever you're eating. Um, and many people are low in vitamin D without realizing it because we have such indoor lifestyles. It's a hormone made through sun exposure on our skins. Uh, and of course, if we're not in the sun as much like, we're, you know, I'm not in California. I wish I were. Um, but even in California, you know, you're going to be in an office a lot of the time all day. You, you'd you be mm-hmm. wearing sunscreen. <laughs> so you may not be making as much vitamin D. So that's something that's really important important to be aware of as well for everybody regardless of what they're eating um and uh, yeah i think those are the main things and and when you're when you're nursing remember that's where your calorie needs your protein needs your calcium needs 
are all going to be at their highest, actually. So that's the time at which you're not going to be prioritizing your own health because you're just going to be getting from day to day, focusing on the baby. But it's just as important to focus on yourself and make sure that you're getting all those nutrients in for you and for baby. And also, I would recommend, um, as I mentioned before, a B12 and a vitamin D supplement for women who are nursing and also to consider their iodine as well in their supplement form. And you mentioned, sorry, uh, just this one more question on this. You mentioned non-seaweed iodine. Wondering, is there a problem with seaweed? So seaweed is a great source of iodine. Um, and nori sheets in particular are great fun, especially for kids. They can have them as snacks, and that's a great way of getting the iodine in. Um, but a lot of dietitians recommend a supplement that has not come from iodine sources just because if you're taking it in supplement form, uh, often uh, things like kelp have sometimes a very high level of iodine, sometimes a very low level of iodine. Mm -hmm. You don't really know. Um, the levels are not standardized. And you, it's not great to have too high a level of iodine, um, just as it's not great to have it too low. Like Goldilocks, you need just the right amount. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why dietitians often recommend a non-iodine, uh, a non-seaweed iodine supplement, just for simplicity, really. Um, that, not that that's necessarily 100% uh, recommended. Uh, you don't have to do that. Many pregnant women will continue to consume things like nori sheets for their iodine or even kelp supplements. But I would personally recommend having it as part of their normal prenatal just to be on the safe side. Mm. Okay. Wow. I'm glad I don't have to worry about that, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> Alexandra and I are like, oh we're child gosh. free by choice, the two of us. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Well, there's, there's many advantages to not having to go through pregnancy and childbirth and breastfeeding. <laughs> I can assure you of that. <laughs> no doubt. What would be, uh, I'm asking this question somewhat selfishly because I always learn something. Um, what, what would be the, the go-to breakfast, lunch, and dinner that you recommend to, um, you know, maybe a patient that is like, okay, I'm in, let's start this. I'm going to go whole foods plant exclusive uh, to kind of tantalize their taste buds. So they realize how wonderfully uh, delicious and filling it can be. Yeah, well, if if we're talking taste bud tantalizing, then I love making pancakes for breakfast. Uh, plant power pancakes. They're so yummy. We tend to have them every weekend with the kids. And they're in the they book. Really... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, they are. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and um, about easy I... though, too. I think that's also something people need, something fast and easy. Something easy is I love overnight oats with seeds. I just, I love putting um, yeah. like hemp and, and uh, flax seeds in my overnight oats. Um, and, you know, just having um, normal, I guess oh, we call it porridge. You call it oatmeal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. nice, that's another nice one to, to just, it's just ridiculously easy. Um, having a healthy like plant, you know, plant-based muesli. Sometimes actually you'll notice that, that certain cereals and mueslis are actually fortified with things like B12 as well, which is a nice bonus. Um, and then right. having, um, especially for kids, like having that with a fortified plant milk, it just means that, you know, they're getting a lot of extra uh, vitamins that they wouldn't otherwise necessarily consume through those foods. Um, so yeah, whole grain toast. I, I love with a little bit of peanut butter. My boys love that. And it's a great mixture because you've got the whole grains, you've got the protein, you've got the fat it's all in one meal mm -hmm. so yeah the, those are very simple options and then for lunch i'm thinking um i'm particularly i just love burritos i just think that they're really oh, yeah and you can put all sorts in them and they're just a, a, a really yummy option um and i really am into using edamame beans in my salads and I love using things like tempeh. I've got this great recipe in the book for like a replacement bacon using tempeh and it's like mm -hmm. a BLT, but it's got tempeh mm -hmm. in it and it's just really yummy. Um, and I really, really love all the curries that I make at home. I think in the UK, we have more of a tradition of making Indian food and I'm really into different types of curry. Um, I, I make something called a cottage pie for the, for the boys, which has got, um, I don't know if you'd have that in the U S but it's, it's just like a really wholesome and sort of, um, I guess, nourishing pie with it's veggies. a comfort food. Yeah. So like the savory, it. I was seeing those over there at coffee yeah. shops. It's like savory pies with potatoes it, and things in them, but we don't have those. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, oh, that might be pasties that you're seeing. 
pasties. Oh, <laughs> that's what I don't remember that name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I'm talking okay. about, it's basically like, um, like a mashed potato pie, <laughs> oh. <laughs> which is in my book as well. It's very hearty food. Um, and I really, I love making like a macaroni cheese recipe for them, for my kids. They absolutely love that. Um, that's in the book as well. And yeah, lo- those are things like that, which are just kind of like comfort foods, but you can make them healthy. Yeah. Um, and in a way that you can add veggies in as well that, you know, are not necessarily quite so obvious for the kids sometimes, which is always handy. Um, so yeah, those are my, probably my favorites and spaghetti bolognese. I love making spaghetti bolognese with, a, you know, obviously a plant-based twist. You wouldn't use the the meat mince for that. Um, I love making it with lentils actually. Yeah. And yeah, I've just, yeah, some of my favorite things. And they're in the book, too, right? <laughs> yes, they are, of course. Good. Um yeah, it's um it's it's certainly my other baby, that book. Um, all the work that went into it. There's chapters on things like diabetes, heart health, mm-hmm. and hormone health, skin mm-hmm. health, plant-based yeah. for all ages. Uh, yeah, everything that you want to know <laughs> is in the book. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really fluid and fantastic, fun to read. But the tools and the tips, as I mentioned in the intro, like you're just a Uh, a genius at that you know it's like it's just it's enough where you understand that the the evidence behind it but then you 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 really go into the practical application which is you know yeah yeah, it's fantastic in that way and in in always so oh go get the book yeah plant power doctor (laughs) a simple prescription for a healthier you (laughs) and folks go to uh, Gemma Newman.com to learn more about her and get more information. I've so enjoyed our conversation. It's been an absolute joy to be on here with you both. And thank you both for all the things that you're doing. You are changing the world. Hey right. folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.